Now that's rather sad, but I think yeah. it's true. <clears throat> and it's because we only have one problem in the whole world, and that's ignorance. They're living in ignorance. They don't know that what they're doing is going to keep them where they are. And they keep doing it. You were making around $14,000 a year after that, shortly after no, that. No, I went from earning $4,000 a, so a, a year to $14,500 a, a month. Exactly. Now, if you annualize that, that was 175 a year. So I went from earning 4,000 mm -hmm. a year to 175. Mm -hmm. I hadn't earned 175 that year. I right. got it up to 14,500 a month. So if you annualize got it, it, that's, got it. That's a change. Phenomenal change. Is it possible for anyone to go from poverty level to extremely Absolutely. financially successful? Absolutely. I think earning money is one of the simplest things I ever learned. And it's one of the most misunderstood things. Wealthy people historically have always had multiple sources of income. They don't have one. They have many. Yeah. I was cleaning floors. I thought the answer was work harder. Because mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to earn some money. Yeah, of course. And I thought it was all important. Today, my attitude towards money has changed dramatically. But I thought the answer was get another office to clean. Well, I was working so hard, I passed out on the street. I would have been maybe 27, 28. I literally passed out on the street. I was working so hard. I came to, and there's a great big cop looking at me. I was laying there, it was scary. There was a group of people around me. I saw lights flashing. Then I saw a, guy, a couple of guys in uniform with a stretcher. And it was scary. I had passed out. I guess they thought I had dropped dead. I had a heck of a time getting away from them, but I did get away. They didn't take me to the hospital. I talked wow. them out of it. And I got away and I got thinking, I'm not doing this right. Mm -hmm. Working harder, working more hours is not the way. No. Yeah. In fact, Napoleon Hill wrote that in Think and Grow Rich. He said, if you are one of those people who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought, it is not true. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, never come as a result of hard work. They come if they come mm -hmm. at all in response to definite demands based upon the application of definite principles and not by chance or luck. So you've got to find a demand and fill it, but you've got to follow princ definite principles to do it. Wow. In other words, it's got to be in harmony with the law. You've got to give more than you get. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to get, forget it. Yeah. Well, I got by myself and I thought, I'm doing something wrong. I was earning more money, but here I'm passionate. I said, it's not, this is not normal. And it's like a little voice in my head said, if you can't clean all of them, don't clean any of them. So I got all dressed up. People now accuse me of sleeping in my suit. I got, I wouldn't take a suit off. I didn't matter where I was. Because <laughs> I knew the cleaners were tired and I would go around. I got other people cleaning offices. Mm -hmm. And I knew pretty well where they'd be. So I'd drop around, I'd bring coffee and donuts. and I would drop in and I would talk to them about goals. And then I'd go to the next person. But I always was dressed up because I knew how tired you get. And if I was in working clothes, they'd expect me to help them so they could finish and go home. Interesting. But when I had shiny shoes and a suit and shirt and tie, they didn't expect me to help them clean. So I'd go on to the next place and then the next place. And that's when I started to open offices. Mm. I went from Toronto to Montreal to Boston to Cleveland to Atlanta to London, England. And you hired cleaners? Uh-huh. <clears throat> Everywhere I went. Yeah. Yeah. I had people cleaning. What should someone think about if they're struggling financially right now or they feel like they're, they've been struggling for many years and it feels like they're just surviving week after week, month after month, they're not sure how to get to that kind of sense of freedom for at least a six month runway or beyond. What should they start thinking about? Do you know what you've just described, I believe the majority of people are living that way. Yeah. The majority. Now that's rather sad, but I think yeah. it's true. <clears throat> and it's because we only have one problem in the whole world, and that's ignorance. They're living in ignorance. They don't know that what they're doing is going to keep them where they are. And they keep doing it because they don't know how to change. They're overwhelmed with the debt. People are saying, I need the money. They haven't got it. They want to take their family on a vacation. They don't have the money to go. So they may borrow it and go anyway. Now they've got more debt. They have to understand 
that they don't have to live that way. Mm. I wrote a book called You're Born Rich. The truth is you are. Most people are just a little short of money, mm -hmm. but you are born rich, rich mm -hmm. in potential. Anybody can go to our site, go to bobproctor.com. You can download the book, You Were Born Rich, free. It won't cost mm -hmm. you a cent. Mm -hmm. And chapter two is how much is enough. There's a, it's described very well how to get out of debt. You gotta create a debt repayment program where it's all done automatically. Mm -hmm. And then you focus on prosperity. You've got to have a financial goal. You've got to work toward it. And you've got to understand that you can earn more than you're earning. And wealthy people don't have one source of income. They have more than one. I was earning money all last night while I was sleeping. Yeah. You can actually earn more money when you're sleeping than you can spend when you're awake. Yeah. You know, it, it sounds like a cute line, but it's true. There's no end to what we can earn. If you are not getting information from someone who is already wealthy, then you're probably getting information from the wrong people. Most people ask their brother-in-law or the guy next door or the girl they know, how do I earn more? Hell, if they knew, they'd be earning it. They don't know. And most <clears throat> people talk to people that don't know. Carlyle put it very well. He said he did not believe in the collective wisdom of individual ignorance. Mm. And that's where most people are getting it from people who don't know any more than themselves. I think you have to go, that's why these seminars are so important today. Yeah, yeah. People have the opportunity to go and learn. Most people won't pay to go. I tell people, listen, you invest in this, it'll probably be, the, in borrow the money to do it, it's probably the last time you'll ever have to borrow money. Yeah, we, I'm not, Our seminars are not raw, raw, it's not, nothing. Our seminars teach people about themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like when Bill Goff said, if I want to be free, I gotta be me. I'm thinking, I better know who me is. I didn't know mm -hmm. who me was. I was doing a lot of things. I was doing them right, and I was earning money, but I didn't know who I was. I start, started to study me. Mm. And the more I know me, the better I know you. You only yeah. have to study yourself. You'll know what everybody, because we're all the same. Yeah. It's our behavior that's different, our results that are different. I heard uh, a friend of mine, Dean Graziosi, I don't know if he coined this or someone else said it, and he said it from someone else, but he said, those that pay, pay attention. And when you invest in yourself, you're paying attention. To you know, I never heard that before, but that is the truth. Those that pay, pay attention. But if you don't pay for it, you're not going to pay as much attention. If you pay more, you'll pay more attention to learn. I had this. an aunt and uncle who were as poor as church mice. I mean, they just didn't have anything. <laughs> and they had a whole house full of kids. And I used to drop by their house periodically. I was doing very well. And I was teaching seminar. And I remember it was around Christmas time. And he was rushing around trying to get credit cards from some big stores so they could buy presents for the kids. Yeah. And I said, you know something? He said, never mind, next year will be different. I said, you know something? Next year is going to be exactly the same as it is this year because you never change you. Wow. I said, you should get into the seminars and learn something. I know something you don't know. Well, they came to the seminar. He got paid every two weeks. So that meant three times a year, I think he'd get paid three times, maybe four times a year, he'd get paid three times in a month. That one pay was extra because they were budgeted for two pays. I made them pay to come to it. Wow. Something said I made them pay. And I think they thought I should have comped them into it. But you know, Mark thanked me, my aunt, I don't know how many times that I charged them. She said, we wouldn't have kept coming. I didn't even know what you were talking about. I was running seminars. Was seven evenings from seven to 10. It was running over a series of nights years ago. And she said, I wouldn't have kept coming. But she said, because we paid, I came. Of course. He's right. If they pay, they pay attention. That That's is it. so true. And if they don't, they you're not don't gonna be a, you don't gonna care. When you hear something you don't like, eh, this is not for me. That's Let me right. get out of here. Mm -hmm. eh, I got something better to do. Yeah. Especially in LA, ah, I wanna go to the beach. Mm -hmm. This is too hard work. Yeah. It's confronting my ego. Ah. I don't need this. I'm firmly convinced if a person doesn't understand a paradigm, a paradigm is, an, is nothing but a multitude of habits. Uh -huh. They're programmed into your subconscious mind that control your behavior. It's got nothing to do with how smart you are. It's got nothing to do with what your formal education is. It's got nothing to do from which side of the tracks you come from. Mm -hmm. It has to do with your paradigm. The paradigm is a program in your subconscious mind. It's both genetic and environmental that's controlling your behavior. Everyone that can hear my voice knows how to do better than they're doing. And they may wonder, why don't I do it? 
It's because you're programmed to do what you're doing. Yeah. And until you change the program, nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. Paradigm has to be changed. I love that. What would you say are the, if you could share three key habits for people that if they want to continue to grow every day, be more prosperous, be more abundant, happier, joyful, healthier in their life, what are three key things, habits every day, not talking about morning routine, but just overall habits every single day, what should people be focusing on consistently? They should study every day. Study. They should have a mentor. Someone that has already accomplished what they dream about. They might not even know the person. They could get introduced to them and ask them, what are half a dozen things I should do every day? Yeah. Ask them. They know. Mm -hmm. Most people are getting advice from people that don't know any more than themselves. Yeah. And the third one, you've definitely got to have a goal. And when you write it, you've already got it intellectually. So you operate intellectually, emotionally, and physically. Well, your intellectual mind, the second you say, the second you decide on it, you've got it. It tells you in the Bible, before you speak, I'll hear you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's because the thought always precedes the word. Mm -hmm. The second you get emotionally involved, you've got it emotionally. Yep. So you've got it intellectually, you've got it emotionally. It's only a period of time till you've got it physically. Mm. Be, do, have, yeah. That's right. But the have comes in a period of time. So it's, every, not, it's not overnight? <laughs> every seed has a gestation or an incubation period. Yeah. When a woman gets pregnant with a child, it takes 280 days. Yeah. The husband doesn't come home a month later and say, come on, where is it? Right. He waits, as James Neither. Allen said, as one who understands. Mm. He understands there's a gestation period. Where I come from, if you plant a seed for a carrot, it takes approximately 70 days for it to manifest. Mm. All physical seeds have a gestation or an incubation period. We know that now, but we didn't always know that. We weren't always aware. No one knows what the gestation period is for a spiritual seed, and an idea is a spiritual seed. Mm -hmm. But we do know that it operates by the same laws. And the laws of the universe are precise. They can be studied. Yeah. They can be understood. We operate by law. Our life is governed by laws. Like we know it's going to get dark tonight. We don't wonder if it is. Yeah. You know when the tide goes out, it's coming back. Winter never follows winter. We know these things. That's all an expression of law. Mm -hmm. Well, when we bring our life into harmony with the laws, we're going to enjoy more of life. Yeah. If we fight it, we're going to lose. Yeah. You know? This is amazing. What is something that uh, you are proud of that most people don't know about you? Uh, I don't really know. I spend all my time thinking about how to teach this, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm proud of our company. Yeah. I'm proud of the people I work with. Uh, proud of my family. Mm. Um, I just love what I do. I just love it so much. Um, I think it's such a shame when people don't study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because and that's your first habit, yeah. Well, there's so much about us that we don't know, and we can do anything. Um, life is pretty special, you it's know. It's amazing. Oh, well, really? Yes. It's incredible. Uh, yeah. Do you have any fears? Oh, I have lots of fears. Yeah, I mean, if you're innocent, you don't know, but you don't let them control you. Yeah. You know, um, I think someone said that courageous people aren't, don't have any fears. Eddie Rickenbacker said there's no courage without fear. Mm -hmm. you, you, courage gets you to face the thing you fear. So I have, yeah, I have fears. To do, anytime I go to do anything that I've never done, I'll be afraid, but I won't, that doesn't stop me. Yeah. In fact, I call that hitting a terror barrier. You know, a terror barrier. A terror barrier. That's you got to like you get a new idea. Let's suppose a person's got an idea; they're going to quit their job and start their own company. 
That's an exciting idea. They're intellectually involved with it. That's all. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can play with that all they want. In their mind. Nothing's yeah. ever going to happen because it's just intellectually. They take the idea and they get emotionally involved with it. Mm. Now all hell breaks loose. Yeah. They hit the terror barrier. Ooh. They start to feel the fear. Uh -huh. And if you don't go through the terror barrier, where do you go? You're right back into safety. Bondage, and that's where most people live because mm. they don't know how to do it. They don't know where the money's going to come from. They don't know where the help's going to come from. It's, I, like, I heard one time, a thing when uh, Tama Maharaji was going to take TM to the world, one of his advisor said, well, where's all the money going to come from? He says, wherever it is right now. Wow. <laughs> I love that, because that's where the money's going to come from. So when people hit this fear because they haven't got the money, they don't know how, they want to realize the way is already here. If nothing's created or destroyed, if all the power is 100% evenly present in all places at the same time, everything we've got is, we've got it right here, it's right here. We just don't understand it. So you hit this terror barrier. If you don't go through it, you're toast. Yeah. So but you always stay in your comfort zone. You'll never be able to yeah, grow. Yeah. So if something doesn't scare me, I know I'm not growing. It's something that, you know, as an athlete, or did you play sports growing up at all? Any, not a lot. No. You know, some recreational stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As an athlete, I was in pain almost every single day. We would, our coaches would push us to a, sure. a limit that we didn't want to go to. Yeah. They wouldn't hurt us, you know, where we'd be broken bones, but it was painful. I'd much yeah. rather be laying on the couch, <laughs> playing video games or whatever it is, having mm -hmm. fun. But that pain threshold, you know, breaking through that pain barrier and discomfort always made me feel a little more confident in myself. Like, wow, I was able to do that. I didn't think I could push that far, but now I can do a little more tomorrow. And doing that every day over years, it's conditioned me to want pain every single day in a healthy you see, way. You know? That's where the coach played it, an integral role. Yeah, huge. The coach is the mentor, the, you know, and that's what they pay. And if you, I think if you have the right coaching for a period of time, then you said now, if, it's in me. You see, it's part of you it's now. Well, that's where it is. It's part of me. Like fear would never stop me. Um, in fact, if it doesn't scare me, I know I'm probably not going in the right direction. Yeah. You know. Should we face a terror barrier every day? Is it too much to do it every day? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Is it helpful if we're looking for things that scare us every day? Well, yeah, you should be going that way, yeah. you know. Um, and you'll realize after you go through it, you step through fear into, into safety. This is one of the best pieces of literature I have ever read. I'm going to read it through. It's only about 20 lines. And then we'll talk about it for a few minutes. Great. My mind is a center of divine operation. The divine operation is always for expansion and fuller expression. And this means the production of something beyond what has gone before, something entirely new, not included in past experience, though proceeding out of past experience by an orderly sequence of growth. Therefore, since the divine cannot change its inherent nature, it must operate in the same manner in me. Consequently, in my own special world, in which I am the center, it will move forward to produce new conditions always in advance of any that has gone before. I'm going to, um, I'm just going to photograph, I'll take a picture of this page and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send it to you. That, Please. The start of this is the key. My mind is a center of divine operation. Now, if I held a basketball here, there's only one point in that basketball that's center, isn't there? And that's determined by the outer measurements of the ball. Agreed? Mm -hmm. There's only one center in this studio. I don't know where it is. I don't even know how to find it, but I know somebody would know how to find it. In all things, there is only one center. This literature says my mind is a center, which would indicate there's more than one center. Mm. So if you study this long enough, and I finally figured out why, this, the man that wrote this is one of the most brilliant writers I think I've ever studied, Thomas Troward. My mind is a center. When you're, deal when you're dealing with divine operation, you're talking about infinite. There is no outer ring, so any point center. Hmm. Your mind, Lewis, is a center 
of divine operation. And the divine operation is always for expansion and fuller expression. This means the production of something beyond what's gone before. So there's something coming. It's going to be better than everything in the past. I'm going to send this to you. I want you to read it every day for 90 days. Okay, yeah. Send it to me. I'll this print it will out. stretch your mind. When you say, what do you study? I want, to, I want to expand my awareness. I want a greater awareness of my relationship with the whole scheme of things. Isn't it crazy that we are standing on a moving ball in the middle of infinite space? Yes. Yeah. When we, when we think about that sometimes, that it's, we're on a little ball, a little dot on a little ball that's rotating yeah. in the middle of infinite space. Yeah. <laughs> moving at a ridiculous speed. Do you know, the more you study this, the more you realize what a magnificent creation you are. When you stop and just take a look at your hand, there's enough potential energy in that little finger to light up this building for probably a month. Mm. There's about 11 million kilowatt hours per pound potential energy locked up in the electrons in the atoms of the body. We are a, a living dynamo. The blood circulates through your body hundreds of miles of passageway every 33 seconds, carrying all the food and all the garbage out, boom, like that in one sweeping change. For you to move any part of your body, you must activate brain cells. The brain is an electronic switching station. The more we study and look at this, the more mind-boggling it is. You know, we're taught we're God's highest form of creation. Um, that's taught in all religions. There's only a half a dozen religions there in California. You've got, I think, 500, but everybody starts their own there. <laughs> and the truth is, you can start your own religion there, and many do. Mm -hmm. But there's a half a dozen major religions. They all teach essentially the same thing. We are truly God's highest form of creation. And we act... Sometimes not much better than some of the animals that we keep as pets. You know? You, I think, shows like yours you do such an enormous amount of good. Mm, thank you. Well, what you really do, you provoke people to think about a lot of different things. And if people will begin to think, thinking is the highest function we're capable of, and thinking can be taught. Unfortunately, it's not being taught, but it can. You know, it's the highest function we're capable of. You know. So it's, um, it's worthwhile learning. Absolutely. I think a lot of us are... We're not taught to think. We are conditioned to react to well, no what's happening that. around us. And we, and we react. We don't think before we react. We just react. And so that's what causes us a lot of stress and overwhelm. You know, Victor uh, Frankl um, wrote a marvelous book, Man's Search for Meaning. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yep. He, uh, well, he, he was a marvelous author. And he said, in every situation, between the situation and your response, there's a space. It might only be a millisecond, but in that space, you have the ability to choose how you're going to react or respond. When you react, whatever you're reacting to is in control of you, whether it's another person, a condition, or a circumstance. When you respond to the same thing, you stay in control. Ooh. So when you react, they're in control. The environment is. When you respond, you're in control. Yeah. Um, Sandy Gallagher, my partner, she, was, she has a niece. Her niece was at her house one day, and I happened to phone. And she says, would you talk to Anna for me? And um, she was having a problem with her mother. And I was thinking, well, probably you're right. But 
I would imagine your mother thinks she's having a problem with you, you know. And um, what they were doing, she was reacting. And I got, I got explaining it to her. I said, listen, doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter what happens. You have a choice. You're either going to react or respond. When you react, you have lost control of you, and you've given control to the other person or the conditions or the circumstance. When you respond, exactly the same situation, nothing's changed, only you respond. You could say, I wonder why she's saying it like that. I wonder why she wants me to do that now. I wonder why she's upset with me. Well, her mother apparently, if I get this story right, apparently got a hold of Sandy and wanted to know what the hell was going on with that when she went home. She was so different. That's, what, that's a huge lesson to learn. I've been researching this more and just trying to learn from people like yourself on how you have dealt with self-doubt over the years and how you think anyone who feels like they're doubting themselves, what can they do? to go from doubt into confidence? What do you think is the path? Okay, that's a good question. It ties in with the previous question you asked. What do we do with fear? Fear comes from the doubt. So the doubt becomes the cause of the fear, mm. which is the cause of the anxiety, etc. The doubt is the cause, fear is the effect. What is the polar opposite to doubt? Understanding. Mm. It's understanding. That's the opposite of doubt. So what is it we want to understand? Well, if it's me that's entertaining doubt, why am I entertaining doubt? If I were to find out who I really am, mm. and I believe everything that's been taught down through the centuries, I would have no <clears throat> doubt. I would be realizing that I could do anything. And the only thing that's causing the doubt is a lack of understanding. So I'm going to keep studying. I'll gain a better understanding. I don't doubt myself. I don't doubt what I can do. Um, does that mean that I can do everything? No. When doubt appears, I'll eliminate it. And I'll eliminate it fast because I'm going to figure out how to do whatever it is I'm doubting. Yeah. And you see, if it's me that I'm doubting, it's because <clears throat> I don't understand me well enough. Mm. I did a broadcast the other day. It was all over the place. We had thousands into it on self-image. And we've got to get a better image of ourselves. We have to get a true image of ourselves, understand who we are, how our mind functions. Realize this physical instrument we're living in is nothing but an instrument. It's the instrument of the mind. And the mind expresses itself with and through this thing we call our body. Well, let's understand that better. This thing you got enough power in your one hand to light up that building you're in for probably mm. a month. Wow. There's about 11 million kilowatt hours per pound potential energy locked up in the electrons and the atoms of the body. Well, that's the invisible power that's in me. I want to understand that better. How, what, that's the physical side. What's the higher side? Higher side is my intellectual side. And that is the intellectual factors that I run through earlier. Perception, will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. There's six of them. And um, as I understand those more, as I understand my intellectual factors, I'm using the things that I'm utilizing and developing the things that separate me from all the rest of the animal kingdom of which I'm a part. Mm. Then I can tap into the spiritual essence of who I am because we're spiritual beings. And that's where the greatness lies. Mm-hmm. Mm. It lies in understanding the spiritual essence of who we are. You see, our spiritual DNA is perfect. It requires no improvement. It requires no modification. Our spiritual essence is perfect. And that perfection is within us. So the trick is figuring out how to express it in a greater way. Yeah, and not get trapped into a different type of expression through bad news or friends or parents' beliefs or whatever it is that exactly. tries to shut us down, correct? Exactly. So, and they will try and shut us down because we're coming up and we're saying, I'm going to do this. They'll say, you got to be out of your mind. You're going to quit that good job. Are you crazy? We got to be strong enough to say, I'm going to follow my dream. Mm. Amen to that. I'm a big like believer. Martin in Luther King, I have a dream. 
He didn't say I have a plan. He didn't say I have a bank account. He didn't say, you know, I have a dream. I have an image in my mind. I have a beautiful picture that I want to execute in my life. Self-image. Uh, I love this topic about self-image. How do we reshape our self-image to serve us as opposed to bring us down? Well, it's interesting. Maltz, Maxwell Maltz actually discovered self-image as we know it today. He was a cosmetic surgeon, and he found if he operated on a person, maybe they had a distasteful scar in their face, and he removed the scar, he said, sometimes there was a phenomenal change in the person's personality. But he said other times they'd remove the scar, it was very successful, no change in their personality. That led him to postulate that we not only have this physical image that reflects back from the mirror, hmm. we have an inner image of ourselves. It's how we see ourselves. Right. Now that inner image is an idea. And that idea is generally planted in our little life when we're infants. And it's planted by virtue of the, the environment that we're surrounded by, how we're raised. If a child's raised with praise, they're going to grow up very confident individuals. If a child's raised with criticism, they're going to grow up very insecure. So you see this image that we have, it's a picture of how we see ourselves. But most of us, that image was planted by people that didn't know what the hell was going on. They didn't know the war was over. And they were planting, they were developing a little mind. It was a mind. They were shaping it like fresh clay. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand that. It was a kid they're looking after and we feed him, we keep him warm. What the hell? You know, that's our responsibility. No, it was a mind and they were developing that mind. And if they didn't understand, what were they going to put in? Well, they, all they could give to the child is the insecurities that they had themselves. So that was the picture that the kid grows up of themselves. Mm. Now, I grew up very insecure. <clears throat> I was born during the Depression. When I first went to school, the Second World War had just broken out, so everybody's rationed for everything. It was hard times. All the men were away fighting in Europe or South Pacific. There was no men doing anything. The women that were there were driving the trucks. They were cops. They did everything. So wow. there wasn't a whole of lot of time used for developing a little mind. So I just grew up and picked up what I could. And I grew up very insecure. It wasn't until I met a man that gave me this book and gave me some damn good instruction that I started to pay attention to who I was. And I have never stopped being fascinated with studying me. Yeah. I, I am the most fascinating subject that I've ever come across. And I have found out that you and I are exactly the same. We only appear to be different. Our physical body looks different. We choose different vocations. Some earns more or less than the other. But our potential is exactly the same. Mm. We both live in a physical body. We both have these higher mental faculties. We're both spiritual beings. We both draw on an infinite source of supply. We're the same. So the trick, I think, for the person that has insecurities, that hasn't got the strongest image they want, they should find a damn good mentor. That's what changed my life. That's what the School of Greatness is for doing for people that are tuning into it on a regular basis. Because I don't think you have any schlocks on here. I don't think you have people coming on here who don't know what the hell they're talking about. I don't think you have people come on here just to make a noise. I think you come on to pick the best of their mind. You're going to pick their mind for their listening audience. Mm -hmm. You've got a big name out there. It's a, uh, you know, it's a lot of people listen to you. Pay attention. So, and that's why, because you're giving them the right information. So as we start to gather this information about ourselves, our image starts to change. And I started to see, I'm not this skinny kid that doesn't know what the hell's happening that did poorly mm. in school. I'm a spiritual being. I have a marvelous mind. I can think. If I can imagine it, I can hold it in my hand. I can do anything that I want. What are the habits of those people thriving versus the other people that maybe who were successful but fell off a little bit over the last year? What would you say are some of those habits that differentiate the successful during challenging times? Well, it's, it's, there's 
it's, it's really obvious. You know, the law of the animal kingdom is adapt or die. And mm. if you let the outside world control you, you're toast. Because when anything goes wrong, it's in control. When you control from the inside, like we're in control of ourselves, we're in control of our world. So it doesn't matter what happens, you figure out how to get to where you're going. Um, the goals don't change. Sometimes the methods of getting there do. But uh, I have never, I think probably I had great teachers. I had a half a dozen phenomenal mentors. And I think I was raised the right way. You stay in control regardless, you know. Yeah. What would you say are some of the habits that you have that people wouldn't expect that you would have? Maybe they would expect certain things like waking up early or journaling or, you know, getting eight hours of sleep. But what are some habits that you do differently that maybe are unexpected in the personal growth space? I study every day, every day. Mm. Um, I've studied every day now for 60 years. I started to study this book in 1961, and I read it every day. Same book, Think and Grow Rich. I have uh, just here behind me, I've got the laws of success, the original ones that Napoleon Hill wrote in 1928. And then he came up with this in 1937. And the man that gave it to me, he said, if you'll study this every day, he said, you're going to have a wonderful life. And he pointed out Napoleon Hill spent his whole life studying the lives of 500 of the world's most successful people. He was mentored by Andrew Carnegie, who at the time was the wealthiest man in the world. And he said, since he spent his whole life putting this together, he said it would be a prudent move on your part if you spent the rest of your life trying to understand and apply what he was teaching. And, <laughs> right. you know, that just seemed to make some sense to me, and that's what I started to do, and I've never stopped. If there was only one principle inside of Think and Grow Rich that you could only live by and only talk about, and you wouldn't be able to talk about anything else inside the book, what would that one principle be? Persistence. He said there, he, he said in the book, he said, there may be no heroic connotation to the word, but the quality is to the character of the human, like what carbon is to steel. See, I think the trick, Lewis, is get some good habit patterns and live with them all of your life. Because you're either going to grow or you're going to die. It's, uh, it's create or disintegrate. There's no such thing as leveling out and staying where we are. And some people think they can just hold it where they're at, but they can't do that. You're either going to go ahead or you're going to go backwards. It's create or disintegrate. And so if you have good habits, you're going to keep growing. Way back, I think around 1938, 39, Albert E. N. Gray worked for the Prudential. And he wrote uh, The Common Denominator of Success. It's a great article. And he said, the common denominator of success is informing the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Mm. And he was speaking one time, the young guy said, why do successful people like doing these things? And he said, they don't. <laughs> That's why they've turned them into habits. <laughs> you know? I thought that was beautiful. He said, That's why they've turned them into habits. They don't like doing them. You see? And of course, a habit. What, is, what do you think? Well, a habit is something we do automatically without any conscious thought. We just, it's part of our paradigm. We're programmed. What do you think are the three most difficult habits to develop uh, that actual, actually will support us for the most growth long term if we can take these habits on? One of the things I think the most difficult is repetition of studying the same thing. Mm. I have a. Uh, a book here on my desk. It's in a book holder. And when I went to visit Earl Nightingale way back mm, 1968, six, no, it was earlier than that, it was around 66, and I saw he had this book stand on his desk, and I asked him what it was. He said it was a book holder. And I said, why do you have it? He says, because I want to read those two pages every day for the next month, maybe two months. I said, really? 
the same thing. And he said, yeah. He said, then they'll become a part of me. Mm. And he said, that's really the, success, the secret of success is the repetition of an idea. You see that in sports, you play ball. I mean, mm -hmm. it's definitely part of your game, you know. Um, how, many, how many plays would you have in your head? Who? Um, well, a lot of different plays, but in football, there's really only like nine different routes a receiver can run yeah. as part of the tree of, ru of running a route. But there's so many different variations within plays that that one receiver could run, and then another person could run in tandem with that. Yeah. So you have to – there's a massive playbook – that you go through at the beginning of the season, and you've got to remember a lot of different things. But if you typically know the route you need to run and what other people are doing around you, then you can you can figure it out. But it's repetition that enables you to do that, isn't it? Over and over and over and well, over. You see, the same route over and over. That doesn't just apply to football. I think that applies to life. And if a person will really understand that, it's through repetition that you program your subjective mind. And it's your subjective mm -hmm. mind that controls your behavior. Doesn't make sense to some people, but if they would study it and start to understand it, they would start to do it. What's the most important thing on those two pages that you have open in front of you? Most important thing here. Read it to you. The lesson to be learned from the practical aviation of the present day is that of triumph of principle over precedent of working out of an idea to its logical conclusion in spite of the accumulated testimony of all past experiences to the contrary. With such a notable example before us, can we say that it is futile to inquire whether by the same method we may not unlock still more important secrets and gain some knowledge of the unseen causes which are the back of external and visible conditions? And then by bringing these unseen causes into a better order, make practical working reality of possibilities which at present seem but fantastic dreams. They're talking about the Wright brothers. He said there was a secret. They got off the ground because nobody knew how to fly. And neither did they until after they got it in the air. But he pointed out that it was principle over precedent. And... We let precedent control us too often. What's the difference between principle and precedent? Well, precedent, you're let, letting something that has happened in the past control you. The principle mm. uh, is that there's always a better way. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Better is a beautiful word. What's something in your life that took a long time where you were holding on to the precedent of something for a while? Maybe it was months, maybe it was years, decades, that eventually the principle finally started to fly and you had a breakthrough. Is there an area of your life you can think of? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Just as soon as you said it, yeah. You see, <laughs> when I started in this, when I first got this book, um, I was such a loser. And I mean, in every... Every way you look at it, I, um, I went to high school for two months. And I didn't quit. They kicked me out. They didn't want me there. Um, and I was kind of happy because I didn't like it there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I held dumb jobs. I never had a half-decent job. The idea that I could even get a good job never entered my mind. I had such low self-esteem. I didn't understand that at the time. I didn't even know what self-esteem was. And letting go of the fact that I didn't have a formal education, that I never had any business experience. The man that gave me the book, he said, none of that matters, Bob. That's the past. He said, let it go. Well, I had a difficult time letting that go because we're programmed that if you don't go to school, you can't get a good job. That if you're going to earn a lot of money, you've got to be really smart. Well, you see, I didn't think I was very smart, and I didn't have any formal education. That's a hard thing to let go of. 
Mm -hmm. But through the repetition of studying this over and over and over, and as he pointed out to me, Edison had grade three. Mm. And he pointed out different people that had no formal education. And I finally made a break, got it, left it behind. I'm not quite sure exactly when, but I let it go. Yeah. What would you say are some deciding factors that can help someone with their self-esteem? Because you and I are very similar. Where my childhood, I didn't, I didn't have much confidence in myself or mm -hmm. esteem because I was in the bottom of my class in school because I was you know, had tutors and special needs classes because I just wasn't able to understand it and comprehend that well and felt awkward and goofy in my life. What are some, some things you think people that in their teens or even in their 40s and 50s who don't have confidence yet, what are the things we can be doing differently to gain confidence, to build self-esteem? Because I think this is one of the key factors of success is believing in yourself. It doesn't matter if the world believes in you if you don't believe in you. Yeah. What can we start to do to change that? Well, I think a person has to start to study themselves. Most people know very little about themselves. They think they're their body. You're not a body. You have a body. And you have a marvelous mind. And when I first started to study this, I thought, you know, studying the mind, that's for psychiatrists, psychologists, behavioral scientists. And the man that told me, he said, no, it's not. He says, that's for anybody. That's for little kids. And so I think as we start to understand something about our mind and something about our higher faculties, see, we're, we're all programmed to live through our senses. We go by what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Well, I've got a little dog at home that can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. All the animals in the world, they're, they're completely at home in their environment. They blend in. They operate by instinct, which is perfect. Um, we had instinct removed, and we had higher faculties put in our place, in their place. And if we would study these and gain an understanding, your self-image would automatically start to improve. You have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. Those six faculties will give you the ability to create your own environment. See, we're totally disoriented in our environment where all the other little creatures are completely at home in theirs. And we're, we're disoriented in ours because we can create our own, but we don't know that. School doesn't teach us that. School is more interested in, in the development of your intellect than in the development of awareness. Mm. Like, um, a person doesn't earn $100,000 a year because they want 100 a year. They earn 100 a year because they're not aware of how to earn 100 a month. Awareness is really the key. And when we become aware of who we are and what we've got working for us, you know, marvelous things start to happen to us. And that's really what happened to me. I never went back to school. Um, I... Um, I built a very successful company. It operates all over the world. Um, I didn't do it myself. I have a tremendous team of people. I've got a, just an absolute genius of a business partner, a, a woman who's an attorney. I mentioned to you before, you should have her on sometime. You'd, she, you'd be fascinated with her. She's that interesting. But there's a group of people. We've attracted a phenomenal group of people in our company. Mm -hmm. And we're operating now in 91 countries. Wow. Teaching this information. You know, it's, I don't know another company that teaches what we teach. Like I think um, Tony Robbins has probably done more for our industry than any individual. The Secret has probably done more for it as much as Tony has. Um, the movie. Um, but there's, I don't know anybody else teaching what we're teaching. And what we're really doing is teaching people how their mind functions and um, how to expand their understanding of how it operates. What are the six 
faculties again. You shared this before, which yeah. I which I love, and I think if people really understood this, perception, help them build their self image. There's perception, yep. the will, mm -hmm. imagination, memory, reason, and intuition. Which one is the hardest for people to? I don't think any of them are awareness. They're they're all equally valuable. Um, mm -hmm. You take your imagination. Think of this for a minute, Lewis. Nothing is created or destroyed. Look here. Here's a little cell phone. What you can do with this almost blows your mind when you think of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was a kid, we didn't have a phone. We didn't have a phone because we didn't have any money for the first reason. But the second, um, not everybody could have a phone. We were not aware that there was an infinite number of frequencies. Today, there's, what, a zillion phones because there's an nice. infinite number of frequencies. This phone is on its own frequency. Yours, it's on its own frequency. If I have your number in here and I hit send, you and I connect, we're on the same frequency. It won't matter where you are. We can see each other. We can communicate because we get on the same frequency. Well, the good that we desire is already here. It's on a frequency. The way to build this has always been here. We weren't aware of it. But somebody took their imagination and went off into no place. What they were really doing is going on to a higher frequency. And if you'll stay on that frequency, you'll attract everything that you require. That's why um, Dr. Warner Von Braun, when President Kennedy asked him what it would take to build a rocket that would carry a man to the moon and then bring him back safely to Earth. Von Braun said the will to do it. The will mm -hmm. is the mental faculty that gives you the ability to hold one idea on the screen of your mind to the exclusion of all outside distractions. <sighs> See, if you take your imagination, do it. You have goals. Take your imagination and then take yourself there, see yourself already have completed the goal. Mm -hmm. And then hold that picture with your will. When you go there with your imagination, there is a place. Whatever it is you want, you went there with your imagination, there is a place. You stay there in your imagination. You will attract everything that's required for the manifestation of that picture. You saw Brady doing it last Sunday. Yeah, as a machine. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal. So holding the imagination, the picture that you want in your mind, uh -huh. and then attracting it on the steps to get there. Yeah. You see, we don't work toward the goal. We work from the goal. You get the goal mm. in your mind. Our problem is we measure everything on the physical. And... Yeah. You look at the physical and you say, well, I haven't got it yet. If you think your conscious mind, if you get an image there of your goal, you've already got it intellectually. If you didn't have it, you couldn't share it with me. But if you have it, you can share it with me. You can share with me the idea that you've got in your mind. So you've already got it there, haven't you? Right. As you get emotionally involved with that idea, you've got it also on an emotional level. You've got it there. You've got it intellectually. You've got it emotionally. The only place you haven't got it is physically. Now, right. there's a period of time must elapse for that idea that you have intellectually and emotionally for that idea to move into physical form. We hmm. understand. How much time? Pardon? How much time does it usually take? We don't know. We don't know. That's the only thing we don't know is the gestation period for an idea. We know what the gestation period is for wheat. We know what it is for a carrot. We know what it is for a baby. Moment of conception is about 280 days. We didn't always know these things, but we do now. We don't know what the gestation period is for a spiritual seed, and that's what an idea is. But it grows by exactly the same law. And so if we hold that idea in our mind, it must by law manifest in form. It moves into form. 
Now that is called the perpetual transmutation of energy. It's one of the laws of the universe. Wow. Uh, there was something that I uh, that you shared um, just a moment ago that reminded me of an interview I did with uh, uh, Joe Dispenza recently, where he said we're we're really good at remembering the past and actually building a story in our mind about something traumatic that was actually way worse in our mind than it actually probably was in person. We're really good at remembering these stories. But what we need to do, he said, is to remember the future. And when he said that, it kind of triggered something different. It's like what you just shared. It's like have an idea of the future of what we want to manifest and hold on to that idea and remember the memories of the future as opposed to holding on to the memories of the past so we can move into that as opposed to be stuck in the past. That's holding so you see, what that's you what that there. is, yeah. 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 That's, that's and, and it's hard. The why is it so hard? Why is it hard for us to hold on to or maybe not hold on to, but keep in our minds and imagine the idea of a greater future for us as, as opposed to constantly being stuck in the past? Why is that hard for so many of us? Because we're programmed to go the other way. You know, what language do you speak? Uh, I barely speak English. <laughs> How about Russian? Privyet, <laughs> uh, that's all I know. <laughs> well, the point is, you were raised with the English language. Yes. You don't know another language. I was raised no. with the English language. I don't know another language. I was working with people over in Kuala Lumpur a number of years ago, and they had a little boy four years old. That little boy could speak four languages. They thought wow. nothing of that. There's people who speak many more than four languages because that's the way they're raised. We're the product of our environment from the time we're born. But prior to that, genetically we're programmed. You're, you're genetically programmed from the moment of conception. You get all mom's DNA and all dad's DNA. And God knows how far it goes back on either side. Well, that is programming. That's in our subconscious mind. And <laughs> that's called a paradigm. That's what it is. It's a program in our subconscious mind. Now, here's the crazy part. You have programs in your phone or in your computer. The people that write the code for these programs are really smart. Mm -hmm. When it comes to writing code, they really know what the hell they're doing. The people that wrote the code for our biocomputer had no idea what the hell they were doing. <laughs> they don't. They did not. Mm -hmm. They were writing the code for my subconscious mind and for yours. That's our paradigm. And that probably controls our life to an enormous degree. It did with me until I was 26. Now, I was fortunate when I met Ray Stanford and he got me into the Think and Grow Rich book and that led me into God knows what else. I have been working at changing that program since I was 26. I'm 86 right now. So I've been at it for a long time and I work at it every day. Most people don't even know that they have the problem. <laughs> so they stay stuck their whole life. Listen, you interview some pretty interesting people. Um, I watched the interview here a, a billionaire a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. um, Which one? I forgot. I forgot who it was. Anyway, <laughs> Ray Dalio, Charles Koch. It, uh, it was a pretty Paul interesting Dejoria, interview yeah. anyway. But yep. the point is, anybody can become a billionaire if that's what you want to do. You say, well, wouldn't everybody? No, everybody wouldn't. I wouldn't want to put all my energy into that. Now, does that mean I don't want money? No, hell, I earn all kinds of money. And I probably want to earn more. But that's not my focus. We are programmed to live a certain way. And uh, rarely do we change that. Now, I change it, and I teach people to change it. But most people don't. Stop and think of how few people um, are really well off. Three, four, per five percent maximum, if that. And ninety-five percent are struggling. And these are some of these are really bright people. Mm -hmm. You've got people that have a um, 
a doctorate degree in commerce and finance, and they're broke. How the hell could that happen? Well, they never learned how to earn money. They learned how to count it, invest it, and what to do with it. They never learned how to earn it. School doesn't teach us how to earn money. It's absurd when you stop and think about it. Right. They teach us all kinds of stuff. That's A lot of it's useless. But they don't teach us about how to earn money. And money is a medium of exchange that's negotiable all over the world. You know? Yeah. What do you think of the programs or the programming that hold us back the most? The, maybe the two or three things that Well, are, we were talking about earlier, the self-image. That's programming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I have a little great granddaughter, and her mother and father are really fascinating. I'm watching them how they treat this little girl. It is fascinating. Her name is Nora, and if they do anything, they'll say, Thank you, Nora. Nora, that is really good. I mean, this kid, I think, is going to grow up with a, just a phenomenal self image. Now, they have been studying this all their life. And now they've got a little baby, and the two, watch the two of them working with her. It's phenomenal. You know? But I think self-esteem has to be one of the biggest problems. That's not really taught in school. It's not taught in many homes. Um, you take and get into, um, into any of the sports leagues, they don't teach much about the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind's controlling how well you play the game. Mm. What is the thing that's been on repeat for you every single morning to help program your subconscious mind in your favor? Is there a thing you say? Is there a mantra? Is there a meditation? Is there a practice that helps reprogram in a positive way? I have a goal card. Carry a goal card with me all the time. My goal is on the card. I touch that. When, I, when you have a goal and you write your goal... You, you paint a picture with words. Your goal is a picture in your mind. And you paint the picture with words. When you're writing it, you impregnate it into a group of cells in your brain. When I carry this in my pocket, when I touch it, a sensory factor touches affected. It's a light message that goes flying through my body, and it resonates with those cells in my brain, and the picture comes on the screen in my mind. This is a ritual. I've been doing this since 1961. Wow. Um, what's, what, what's on your goal card before I get to the next thing? I want to do $100 million in business. Wow. We don't do that now. I'm doing it in here. Mm-hmm. But physically, I haven't got there. Um, this is Sandy's goal, and it's my goal, and we both got the card signed. It's written in present tense. Um. All your goals should be in present tense. The only thing you put a date on is you're guessing at the date. Mm. You don't know what the date is. You mentioned, I think one of the faculties you said was the most challenging is imagination. Is that one of the most challenging for people? It's not the most challenging. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something we really want to gain an understanding mm. of because most people use their imagination. They use it the wrong way. They imagine what won't work. They imagine something uh. bad happening. Um, what should we imagine more often every day? We should imagine you should see yourself where you want to be. Mm-hmm. You've got to live there. There's a great book. You may be familiar with Stella Adler's book, The Art of Acting. Yeah. Oh, gosh, you've got to get it. Stella Adler was a great acting teacher. She was a method acting teacher. Uh-huh. She, did, she studied and understands Lasky, the, the Russian acting teacher that originated method acting. Okay. Um, Marlon Brando wrote the foreword in her book. He was the first method actor to reach superstardom. Okay. And he wrote the foreword in her book. Now, Stella Adler never actually wrote a book. A man named uh, Kissel took all of her teaching, all of her lessons for teaching, and he, she put them into, or he put them into a book. So when you read her book, you're going to her acting classes. Mm-hmm. And... Like Shakespeare said, we're all actors, you know, the world's the stage, and that's true. Well, when you reach a goal, you're going to act like you're already there. It's already happened intellectually the second you think about it. 
It's already happened emotionally when you're emotionally involved with it. So it's only a period of time until it manifests in physical form. Right. But because it's not in physical form, we act like we haven't got it yet. Yeah. Well, so that's why most people stay stuck because they're acting like they haven't got it yet. Or if I can't act like that, Lewis would see that I haven't got that result. He'll he'll think I'm phony. I gotta quit worrying about what Lewis thinks and start concentrating on what Bob thinks. And so you see yourself, your imagination, you've got to be that person. Goethe said that, great philosopher, he said, before you can do something, you first must be something. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be it intellectually, you've got to be it emotionally. As St. Solomon says, as a person thinks in their heart, the emotional mind. Well, it's only a period of time then until it manifests physically. That's one of the first laws of the universe, is the perpetual transmutation of energy. Energy is moving into form, always, mm. to form moving into form, through form, back into form again. So we cause it all to happen the way we think and the way we stay locked into ideas. Yeah. How should people be uh, developing their imagination on a daily basis in a positive way? Well, I think they should take time to image what they want. I have a business partner, um, Sandy Gallagher, who is a brilliant woman, and she rides horses. Uh, gated horses, mm -hmm. and uh, she's in Kentucky right now in big term or shows there. Mm -hmm. She images herself as a world champion. Every day, she takes the time and she sees herself as a world champion. She sees herself getting the roses, getting the whole thing, and that's the way you should do it. I think you build the image of what you want. I mean, you obviously image this studio yeah. Yeah. before you ever built it. Right. I mean, everything you see here was part of the image in your mind. But everything you create, you create twice. Once in here, once out here, mm. you know? So you never get an original painting. Mm. You always get a duplicate. <laughs> the picture's in here. Wow. So we have to see ourselves with what we want here. Now we've got enormous uh, deterrent in our paradigm, we're conditioned genetically and environmentally. And that conditioning is controlling most people's lives. That's why brilliant people are broke. Brilliant people are unhappy. Brilliant people never really accomplish very much. They're absolutely brilliant, but their paradigm is controlling them. Mm. It's all about intellect. They're smart people. But like, you gotta consider where we come from a little particle of energy from mom, a little particle of energy from dad comes swimming along. That's the nucleus of us. Then that goes on for 280 days, attracting more energy until you make your debut on the planet. <laughs> and then you're programmed environmentally by your environment. So everything that's going on is going right into your subconscious mind. So you come out, you're programmed genetically, we, go, we don't know how far it goes back, four or five generations possibly. Like when I was a young man, I had red hair. Mm. My mother didn't have red hair, my dad didn't have red hair, I got a brother and sister and they don't have red hair. And you kind of think, well. <laughs> but my mother's father and all his brothers had red hair. Mm. So sometimes it jumps a generation. That's why we look like our relatives, it's genetic conditioning. And then there's environmental conditioning. We know almost all welfare recipients are fourth, fifth generation welfare recipients. So this is passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, we're all, or fortunately, we're all exactly the same. We got exactly the same potential. Our spiritual DNA is perfect. But that perfection never expresses itself properly because of this paradigm, it's conditioning in our subconscious mind. You see so many brilliant people and they don't make it. I had a good friend of mine, Milt Campbell. He won the gold medal in decathlon. Wow, I was a decathlete. Were you were? I was an all-American decathlete. Well, yeah. Milt won in, in uh, Melbourne in 56. Wow, okay. And he, uh, he won in, uh, in 52 in Helsinki. Wow. When, uh, Bob Mathias won his second gold. He won the gold in 48 and then in 52. Wow. Milt told me, if he told me once, he told me a thousand times, every time I was with him. You know, there was a lot of athletes in schools that were better than me, but they quit. Yeah. Well, our paradigms get us to quit things. 
Why? Because of programming. You're programmed. You have to ask yourself, why don't they do that? I went, I, I did a lot of work with the Prudential of America. In fact, I got stuck in the insurance companies for a number of years. I was so <laughs> effective at what I was doing. And we raised their sales by, one VP said over a billion dollars. Mm. And all I was doing, getting them to change their paradigm. I was having them change the way they worked. A paradigm, a culture is a paradigm. Um, every country has a culture. Mm -hmm. Every family has a culture. Every company has a culture. Well, in the insurance industry years ago, they had what they called debit agents. They went around collecting the money. And there would be a little book like the one you're working with that would have a record in there. I remember we had a, a book on top of our ice box was right near our back door. Mr. Spenceley was the insurance man. When I was a little kid, he'd come in, and there was a little book, a little box with some money, and there's always just pennies. Nice. And he would collect the debit, mark the book, and he'd be on his way. Mm -hmm. And that's how the insurance business operated. They were called debit agents. Wow. Well, then as time moved along, people started to sign a little shit of cheap shit of paper or something and they would automatically draw it out of your bank account yeah but the agents didn't change mm -hmm. the agents would just go and sell at night when mom and dad were both there because you couldn't sell mom if dad wasn't there you couldn't sell dad if mom wasn't there this was a programming so here we are in the 70s agents are still going to their office every morning hmm. and they wouldn't go out and sell anybody because you sell at night Mm. They collected their debit through the day. There was no debit to collect. This had been for years they were still doing this. And I'd, and I'd ask them, I'd say, why do you go to your office? Well, you have to go to the office. And they'd be there, and I'd say, why do you have to go to your office? Well, because we have to go to the office. They didn't know why There's they had no to reason, go. Yeah. Then they'd go to lunch, they'd go with another agent. I said, did you ever sell another agent any insurance? No. I said, what the hell are you going to lunch with them for? I got them to do this. I said, you've got to be like this. You've got to be skin to skin with the person before 9 a.m. And you have to ask every person to buy at least $100,000 worth of insurance. You don't even have to sell them. Just ask them to buy. Well, I got them doing that. They were selling more $100,000 policies in a week than they previously sold in a year in almost every office. Wow. You see, that's conditioning. That's paradigm. That's the way they were working. They've been doing it for years. Nobody ever thought to change it largest insurance company in the world. And the uh, head office was trying to figure out what I was doing because wherever I went, the sales went crazy. I was showing them how to change paradigm. Your paradigm is your conditioned behavior. How do we know when we need to change our own paradigm? You always need to change your own paradigm. How often are you changing yours? I'm working on it right now, every day. Really? Yeah, I work on it every day. But you should only try and change one or two things at a time. Don't try to change everything at once. Well, you know what your paradigm is. Just study your own behavior. Mm -hmm. Think of your results. You want to improve your results, don't you? Sure. You probably want to earn more money. Sure. You probably want this show to be bigger than it is. Sure, yeah. Well, how are you going to do that? You've got to change the paradigm. That's right. You've got to change your habitual way of dealing with these mm -hmm. things. So you take a look at the results and say, what do I want to change? It's the results are an expression of the paradigm, not the intellect. Right. See, the conscious mind is where all our intellectual information is. You know how to do better than you're doing. You know how to do better than you're doing. Sure. I know how to do better than that. Why aren't we doing it? The subconscious is programmed. It's your conscious mind where the intellect is, and that's where we, our knowing is. person knows, but they're not doing what they know. They say, why do you do that? I don't know. Well, you know better, I know. Why are you doing it? I don't know. <laughs> well, I know if their paradigm controls their behavior. Yeah. So you take a look at your results and you say, what's causing that? So you've got to take back your behavior pattern. Why are you doing that? Because you're programmed to do it. Mm -hmm. Right now, the last time we did a, um, a paradigm shift seminar in Los Angeles was a number of three or four months ago. We gave everybody a ring binder. It's a damn thing's about that thick. And on every page, every page is the same. At the top of the page, you write 10 things you're grateful for. Uh -huh. And then there's a statement that you write. I am so happy and grateful now that I know my uh, spiritual DNA is perfect. 
and that perfection is within me. Every morning I look for ways to improve my paradigm. I have to write that with my left hand. I'm right-handed. I'm on my 41st day today. Writing left-handed? Writing left-handed. Why? It's changing the paradigm. I could be just as proficient with my left hand as I am with my right, but I've got to change my paradigm. I'm programmed. Now, when I'm writing, when you're writing, you just write. You don't think. You just, it's, that's why graphical analysts can tell a lot about your personality through your handwriting. Yeah. Of sloppy well, handwriting. If you're don't writing with your left hand and your right handed or your non dominant hand, you've got, to, you've got to consciously pay attention to every stroke, every move your hand's making. And the second you stop, it looks like it was Chinese art that you were drawing. <laughs> right. But I know through repetition, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. It'll probably take me a year. Wow. But I'm learning how strong the paradigm is and how strong, how hard it is to change it. So a year from now, I'll probably be as proficient with one hand as I am with the other. But then I'll stick to it. Wow. What's yeah. the thing you want to change the most within yourself to get to the next level of results that you're uh, looking for? I want to be more effective in selling on a larger scale. So not one to one or one to few, but yeah. one to... Mass. Large, yeah, like I have a sales staff. We've got a pretty mature company. We've got about 70 employees in our company. Wow. So we've got about 10 sales, 20 sales people. Say 10, we have 20. I want to have a larger sales force. I want to create more leads for them because I think what we do is so important. We literally change people's lives. And I'll work until I die. I have no intention to ever retire. I think it's a despicable idea even. Um, so. I'm forever. Now, I worked on an idea last night on the plane. Um, and it's sort of similar. Maybe it was because I was, you knew I was coming in here. Maybe that triggered this. Because mm -hmm. we've been trying to come in here for over wow. a year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, somebody keeps telling me, you know. And dates and, change and everything else. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. We, we just wasn't, we weren't able to be here until today. Anyway, I'm on the plane and I'm thinking, how can I get more people? I have a studio in Toronto. If you're ever in Toronto, you'll have to come and I see it. I want to see it, yeah. We have a beautiful studio. It's a, it's a, like a tele, it is a television station. I had a couple of people from a TV station in one day, and I said, sir, like a television. They said, no, Bob, it is a television. <laughs> I can run four cameras simultaneously. Um, um, young Scott there, he could, uh, he could operate the cameras from right in here on his computer. Mm -hmm. um, I can stream all over the world. It's 50 feet from my house. Wow. And uh, we can stream all over the world from there. And so I'm thinking, I'm going to do, it would be like a webinar, but it won't be a webinar. Like a live cast. It would be a live cast, yeah. yeah. And it'll stream. And I'm really going to teach the people something. I'll use, I won't, I'll use maybe two or three PowerPoints. I'll use a PowerPoint just as a trigger to get the thing going, get them focused on something. And then I'll open it for questions and I'll have chats. Because people learn something on chats. They listen mm -hmm. to me and say, damn, I didn't see that. Yeah. You know, so, the, so we'll have a chat on it. And I'll start doing that right away. Now I've got people working on it. Wow. And I'm calling it Studio 333. Um, there's a story in a book I wrote, 333. And we say we 333 an idea. You only think of how you can, you can't think of why you can't. Um, we say, the guy raised three million, three hours, three days later in a radio station in Toronto through an idea we taught them. Wow. So we call it 333 idea. So I've called this, we had them at 333.com, studio333.com. That's cool. So that's the way it'll come out. And we'll stream it all over the world. And I'll be teaching this information, uh, not in an organized way, but in a, probably in a disorganized way, based on the people we're talking to. Because mm -hmm. um, they ask questions, that's, that's telling me what they want to learn rather than me saying, this is what you should learn. I want to find out what you want to learn. You know? mm -hmm. um, that's, so cool. that's something that I'm building now. Yeah. I want to make it big. That's great. Yeah. Do you feel like you'll ever get close to reaching your potential? No, I know damn well I won't. It's, um, it's not do I think. I know. Neither will you. Um, I think that's the ultimate aim of man. We are created in God's image. Now, everybody's got a different image of that, but we're capable of doing anything. We have infinite potential. Our spiritual DNA is perfect, so there's perfection within us. And spirit's always for expansion and fuller expression. 
never for disintegration. The disintegration we bring about. So spirit's always for expansion and for expression. We're spiritual beings. So that perfection is trying to express itself through us. We stop it. Mm. It's when we get tuned in and we let it come out. But we could part the seas. We can do anything. We are all powerful. All the power, all the knowledge is 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. So that's within you, within me. There's no limit to what we can do. That's really what I teach. Yeah. I teach it, I'll break it down into small bites for a person. Yeah. But you... Um, What's the closest we can get to our potential, do you think? What's possible? Well, the closest you'll get to your potential is where you are right now. Yeah. And then you've got to take and you've got to expand it. You want to do better at what you're doing. Like, you got a great reputation on this show. I think you know that. Yeah. Um, but there's all kinds of people who've never heard of it. Of course. Lots so, of people. Yeah. I want the world to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Well, then, there you go. You want the world to, well, how will you do that? There's your opportunity to develop more of your potential. How will yeah. you do that? Yeah. How can you get more millions? Yeah. You know? You got to use my imagination. You do. You, that's where you're going to start. Imagination, will, yeah. tuition, everything. Yeah. So you got to learn how to utilize those, mm -hmm. how to develop them. Mm -hmm. So you work at it every day. I mean, you're in a, many people would say you're in an enviable position. I, I think I am too, because you're talking to people who know quite a bit about yeah. whatever they're doing. So you're going to learn all the time. It's the greatest you're in, game. You're in school every day. It's the greatest You go to game. work, you're in school. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm very grateful. T Tiffany, you're getting an education she's, probably you couldn't. She's been here for what, three years now, three and a half years. Oh, wow. And she's yes. grown tremendously just She's listening to everyone. Our marketing director, you would love to meet her. Um, she is Mikey Steller. She was Mikey uh, Euler. She got married since she's joined us, had two children too. She was a, a, a nanny when she started to work with us. Now she's our chief operating officer and our marketing director. Wow. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. She had never, never really went to school. But she came in and she just, she'd be something like you. I mean, you're getting exposed to great information all the yeah. time. Yeah. And Tiffany, you got the same potential as I got. Yeah. You know, you look different, you sound different, but we're exactly the same. Mm. You see? I teach that in a seminar. I'll say, like, if I asked you, you'd probably tell me you're black. You know, if I asked somebody else, they'd probably tell me you're black. The truth is you're not. And they tell me I'm white. The truth is I'm not. My shirt is white. If you ever saw a white person, you'd probably scream <laughs> and run. My God, they're white, you know. If I don't know if I've ever seen a black person. Why do they say, we don't see with our eyes, we see through our eyes. We've been programmed to see black. Mm. And you're not black. You see, I think your shirt's black, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty black. Yeah, yeah. But you're not the color of the shirt. Yeah. So why do we say Tiffany's black and Bob's white? Because we're programmed to see that. Now, if we're seeing something that isn't there when we look at another person, how many other times do we look at saying, see something that's not there? Well, that's where our perception has to be yeah, shifted. Yeah. We're all exactly the same. Now, you're not too tall, you're a different shade, and you're a different gender. So you say, well, you're nothing like Bob. You're exactly like Bob. It just doesn't appear that way. But the truth is very rarely in the appearance of things. Mm -hmm. There's so much we can learn. And school's not teaching us. School's not doing the job. What's the thing you feel like you haven't learned yet? 85 years old right now, is that what you said? 80? I'll be 85 next, next Friday. Wow. A week Friday, yeah. You're very young. Happy mm -hmm. early birthday. Yeah. There you go. So what's the thing you feel like you still haven't learned? Oh, well, like everything I'm teaching, I only know a bit of it. Oh. You know, and I don't know all there is to know about our higher faculties. Mm -hmm. I don't know all there is to know about perception or the will or reason. Um, there's so much I don't know of what I'm doing. So I study every day. I want to get, I want to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got to go to somebody that knows more, you know? Yeah. Well, I study a lot of Tom, Thomas Troward's work. He's a wonderful author. He, he wrote the Edinburgh Lectures in Mental Science, the Dory Lecture in Mental Science, The Law and the Word, Bible Mystery, Bible Meaning. He was a great author. You know? 
And there's a woman, Genevieve Biran, she wrote uh, uh, Your Invisible Power. Mm -hmm. uh, she was Trower's only student. She went and studied with him from 1912 to 1914. And she, um, it cost her $20,000. That must have been an enormous amount of money back then. But she was his only student. And she, um, she wrote a book, Your Invisible Power. It's a great book. Your Invisible Power? Your Invisible Power. Okay. I will send you Check a copy. Yeah, I will send do. you a copy. It's a great book. What's your top three recommended books for people of all levels? Well, I'm, that's not one of them, but I will. That is, yeah, yeah. And maybe it should be. Think and Grow is Rich. Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. As Man Thinketh by James Allen. Uh-huh. Are you familiar with that? Yep. Such a great book. Yep. And You Squared by Price Pritchett. You Squared. Yeah. It's a little book. Hmm. You familiar with it? Not sure. You squared. Oh, you'd okay. be sure if you if you knew it. If you had read it, you'd be sure. It's a great book. Okay. Absolutely. It's there's 35 pages. Every page is better than the last page. Wow. There's every page is dealing with a new subject. Hmm. And they're I gotta get that one. I gotta get that one too. I will. I'll send you that. And some of your top you. favorites. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. The, the older we get, the longer we live. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in our lives start to, to leave this earth. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you've had a lot of great relationships that uh, those people are no longer with us. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that do uh, for you when you realize that you're outliving a lot of people that you maybe grew up with or you did partnerships with or that were mm -hmm. influential in your life, uh, you know, at the same time that you've been around. What does that do for you? How does that make you feel and think about when you realize that? You know, I read a book many years ago, Dry Those Tears. Dry Those Tears by Robert Rosen. It's on death and dying. It's a phenomenal book. After I read that, everything changed. You are a soul. You don't have one. You are one. You moved into your body, you'll move out of your body. If nothing is created or destroyed, there's only one, that postulates one theory, life. There is no such thing as death. And I think as we start to understand this, then we handle death totally different. Birth and death are both transitions. You moved into the body, you'll move out of it. Why are we joyous when somebody moves into a body, a new baby, but we're so upset when they move out of it. Well, we lose the physical part. But you, um, I think you gain a better understanding of death as we know it um, and change your concept of it. It's, um, I don't see anybody as gone. I just see gone physically. You can still communicate with them. And... You communicate through thoughts. Spirit's omnipresent. Um, it's in all religions. It's not a new idea. Um, I don't hang around many old people, though. I hang around, somebody asked me how I stay young. <laughs> I hang around young people. <laughs> it's true. You know, it was a joke when I first said it, but um, it's not a joke, it's the truth. I, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I mix mostly with young people. The, uh, we've got a phenomenal team of people in the company, and they're, um, they're great individuals. They really are. And people stay in our company for a long time. Like, my assistants worked with me for 34 years. And, and we, we help the people in the country, company grow. Like I often mention, we've got a chief operating officer. She's also the marketing director. She was a nanny when she came to work with us. She had no business experience at all. <laughs> and um, she just grew up in the company. But we see a lot of That's people cool. in our company like that. And uh, yeah. the longer we're around, the more we develop people like that. You know? Is there, is, is death something you think about or is it something you're afraid uh, of or concerned oh, about? Oh, I'm not at all? at all afraid of it. No, I'm, sometimes I look forward to it. Um, and then I 
smarten up and I thought, wait a minute, when the time comes, it's going to come. I, yeah. You know, um, I am I am so damn interested in what I'm doing. Uh, like I often say, I'd be pissed off if I died right now because i got so much to do. I'm working on a lot of projects right now. And mm -hmm. uh, i got a lot of work to do. We've got... And what, what year were you born again? 1934. What's the, what's the thing that's inspired you the most that you've witnessed in the world, in America, uh, innovations, ideas, oh, just, anything? Just the constant evolution of change. It's, <laughs> everything changes so fast, you know? Uh, Eric Hoffer one time said, uh, that if we, how do you put it? Um, everything's changing so fast. We've got to we've got to keep up with it. We can't let the change stop us. Um, Kind of forgotten. There's a quote that was fresh in my mind and it just left me now. But he was so right. You've got to, you've got to stay with it. You've got to keep changing. You know, if you um, if you don't, you're sunk. Was there a decade that was hardest for you to adapt to or change? Well, the sixties. The sixties. The sixties was hell on wheels for me because that's when I get into <laughs> this book. You see, and. Um, <laughs> Man, I had my past trying to pull me one way and the books and the people were trying to pull me the other way. And I mean, I felt like I was in a tug of war with myself, you know. Um, 70s, it got pretty good. But the 60s was, that was a, it was a rough decade. <laughs> really what, about rough. The, what about the advancement of, of technologies from just cars to planes to uh, having phones and cell phones oh, and, wow. you know, social media, have, all these things that are, you know. I've tried to stay up with it, you know. I'm, mm -hmm. um, I'm not as proficient as I'd like to be with computers. I'd like to be able to know more how to work with them better. But, you know, I've got a couple of phones and I've got a pad and computer going all the time. Um, I make PowerPoints myself, uh, you wow. know. Um, I try and stay up with what's going on. So you're you're on TikTok yourself, huh, Bob? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, no. You know the truth. I don't get on any of the things myself because we've got a staff looking after all that. And if I get That's in, nice. I might screw up one of the routines that they've got. They've got a a pattern that they're working. So like, sure. I don't even go on Facebook. Um, yeah, but I, your team, you've got a team that's up to date with everything oh, for yeah. you, which is Yeah, nice. we've, got, yeah. we've got some excellent people that are on top of that all the time. Like I was saying, we've got, um, we picked up the million viewers on uh, YouTube. We got mm -hmm. the, this plaque here from them a while ago. But we've got, got, the, we've got the, that. It's a gold plaque, right? Pardon? Yeah. It's a gold plaque, yeah. We yeah. just hit a million, so we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get that in the mail soon. Yeah. Um, I love that. What's been the, the most exciting uh, decade or innovation that's happened for you in your life where things started to evolve and change beyond the, beyond the 70s? What's the, uh, the innovation that's been exciting for you that's really supporting um, you? I think this, the time we're in right now is the best. I mean, I just love it. Um, there's so much going on. And... I sit out here in the backyard under an, under a big un, umbrella, and I'd sit out there and I'd look at the back of the yard and I'd get an idea. God, if I built a little place there and I could put a camera in it, and Sandy said, "Let's do it." So I don't know. We got over a million dollars in this place, I guess. And but we've got cameras all over the place. Like you, can, the camera you're on comes out of the ceiling. I got a monitor over here. I can see, and I got another one here. Wow. I got one, two, three, four, five, six cameras right in, in this area. And then there's a control. And this is a what you call a floating cell. This is the building inside the building. So the outside doesn't touch the inside. And, um, and then there's a control room down there where Scott Edwards, he's the program director. He's over in, in Manchester, England right now. 
that he can take all this that's recorded, he could edit it back there in the control room, do it all, ship it out wherever we want to go. Um, we've got just all kinds of material and memory back there. We broadcast, we do a seminar. I think the last one we did, it was 119 countries we went into. Mm, wow. Uh, yeah. It's inspiring. So this is, this is an interesting time for me. And what we're doing now, we're bringing some young people in that really understand how to do some pretty jazzy stuff, you know. Uh, and I love, just love getting up on it and doing it. And I want to acknowledge you. I, lo I love acknowledging you, Bob, because you've been an inspiration to so many people. Uh, I think a lot of people really mainstream in the world got to know about you over a decade ago and with The Secret, uh, and uh, since then I've gotten to know you even more. And I'm just appreciative of your your young heart, your curious mind, your your ability to stay in repetition on things that are meaningful over and over and over again so you can improve and your willingness to teach uh, so many people. You know, you continue to show up and serve and serve and serve. And you, you've set a great example for me. So I'm just appreciative of you. I'm appreciative of our friendship. I'm appreciative of how you are in constant giving mode. And uh, I hope people enjoyed this this interview. But is there any any other final thoughts before we I'll leave wrap you up as today? A quote came to me that I was trying to think of. Eric Harper right. said, the learners will inherit the earth. While the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. The learners will inherit the earth. While the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. See, there's no such thing as a learned person. You're either learning or you're not. That's it. Learning isn't something you fill up and put a cap on. Beautiful truth. Just keep learning. As a child develops, it's developing a sense that life is something that's calling to you to give something, not to get something. I think if I could give any lesson to my child, it's the lesson of contribution, which makes life so meaningful. The depth of relationship that comes from having such a deep love. I think those two things are the minimum, but you gotta decide what do you want for your child? Because 